City of Ann Arbor 2018 Sustainable Ann Arbor Forum, Ann Arbor Water 101, in partnership with the City of Ann Arbor. Thanks to the Ann Arbor District Library for hosting this event. They're great partners and we are thrilled to be closing up our seventh successful season of the Sustainability Forums. How many of you in the audience have been to a Sustainability Forum before? We've got a few pros in the audience. Thank you again for joining us. Um, one special announcement I would like to make from the City of Ann Arbor. At the March Sustainability Forum, Mary Morgan announced that the city rolled out a new small grant program called Sustaining Ann Arbor Together. It was intended to stimulate creative and innovative ideas for action by organizations and residents. This past week, the city announced the first award under the grant program to the Interfaith Council for Peace and Justice. This pilot program is designed to encourage residents in a specific city neighborhood to compost organic food waste and make compost carts more easily available to, for those who do not have one. Joe Oren from Elders Climate Action and one of the co-authors of the pilot project is here this evening and will be available to answer any questions about the grant or the project in the lobby after the session is over. So if you're interested, please make sure you see Joe after we're done this evening. Just a few brief logistics about the agenda tonight. If technology behaves, we're going to watch a short video. I just got a thumbs up, so it sounds like technology is going to work for us. We have a short video on how changes in our local Ann Arbor climate have already led to more intense and frequent storms. Many of you probably have seen this in occurrence, but we have a lot of data and science to show that. Then we do have Omar Gates, a climatologist from the university, getting more in-depth about the changing climate in our Ann Arbor community. Omar, raise your hand. Um, I will be speaking about some of the basics on how we handle stormwater in the city of Ann Arbor. I'm the water quality manager in the systems planning unit, and capital planning and asset management falls under my arena. Then we have Brian Steglitz, the Ann Arbor water treatment plant manager. Hands up. Uh, talking about how our drinking water is award-winning and kind of some of the processes they work with up at the plant. And lastly, we have Earl Kenzie, our wastewater treatment plant manager, talking about how the city treats our wastewater to keep our city and our Huron River healthy and safe. Hold up your little clickers if you have them. In between each of our presenters, we're going to have our own version of a Jeopardy trivia game. Use the clicker that you were given. Please don't share clickers. Make sure you hold on to it. And reply with your answer to each question. There's four questions in, in our, each of the four areas that we'll be talking about. The five people who answer the most questions correctly at the end of the evening will get a prize at the end. We'll use the device ID, which is on the back of your clicker, to identify who you are. And if you are a winner, please be honest, but uh, Emily will be waiting in the back of the room. Hold your hand up, Emily. Thank you. And after we have all the fun with Jeopardy and the prizes, we do want to make sure that there's a Q&A opportunity, because I'm sure you have some deep, meaningful questions that maybe we didn't answer, and we want to give you an opportunity to have that dialogue with the four experts that are going to be here at the forum. So as an introduction, my name is Omar Gates, and I'm a climatologist with the Great Lakes Integrated Sciences and Assessments Program at the University of Michigan. And if you please advance. And just to start off, we are a collaboration between the University of Michigan and Michigan State University. So we are a house that's together for a majority of the year, except that one week in the fall. But <laughs> otherwise, we're a house that's together for the most of the year. And to go into specifics, we are one of 11 NOAA RISA teams throughout the nation. And with that, we try to help the nation prepare for and adapt to climate variability and change. And in particular with GLISA, we try to integrate the best sciences from not only physical and climate sciences, but also the social sciences. And by working with various partners throughout the Great Lakes region, we go through a process of integration, collaboration, and extension with our partners in order to provide services to them that will help them in understanding climate information and climate data within their own workflow. And with that climate information, we try to answer three important questions. They are what has happened, what will happen, and what are the impacts that are associated with climate change in the Great Lakes region. 
So if you would go to the next slide, please. When it comes to my daily job and all the staff that is at GLISA, our main focus is looking at climate change at not only the global scale, but at different scales as well. Thank you. So with that, we look at climate change from not only the global scale, but also regional and local. And as we go smaller and smaller in scale, we understand that the climate change impacts do change. And with the smaller scale, we can more readily adapt to such drastic changes. So now that we talked a little bit about what GLISA is, let's go into what the trends are for the overall Great Lakes region. So from our observations, temperatures are rising. The rising temperatures have been observed to be two degrees Fahrenheit, and this is from the period of 1951 through 2017. And to add more emphasis to the rising temperatures, in the future, according to the third national climate assessment, we're going to see temperatures rise from four to six degrees Fahrenheit. And this is varying throughout the entire region. And to put it more into context, into a graphical or visual form, this is more of an example of what the Great Lakes region will look like under a high emission scenario. So for all you climate followers out there, this is under A2 scenario. Or if we just didn't do anything about our emissions today, just kept on pumping out every last emission we could possibly do, this is what we will see. So to go into more detail about this diagram, we see that from the southern parts, you don't really see much change. But in the northern parts, you see much drastic change, especially in the western or in the Upper Peninsula per se. With that, we're seeing temperatures range from 3.5 to 6 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the region. And with this, you may be asking, why is it that you see not as much change in the south or in the southern states? It's because they're used to such high temperatures. We talked about the temperatures and the possible outcomes of that. Let's go on to precipitation. So for the overall Great Lakes region, we're seeing an increase of 11.9% in total annual precipitation throughout the region. And again, this is not consistent across the region as you've seen in the next slide, but for the most part, there are areas that are seeing increases and decreases. For example, in Southeast Minnesota, it's seen a great increase of 23% in total annual precipitation. However, as we go into our own Western Upper Peninsula, we're seeing a decrease, but just a slight decrease of 1%. So that's something to keep in mind. And just to get further emphasize the variance of, or the difference in changing of the precipitation throughout the region, this is just a diagram under the same high emission scenario of A2. So again, if we just didn't do anything to our emissions whatsoever, this is how precipitation would be like. So again, to point out, we have the Western Upper Peninsula showing a moderate increase or no change at all. But in southern Minnesota, we're seeing again that increase. But one thing in particular is southern Ontario, in which we see a greater increase compared to the rest of the region. So this is just something to keep in mind when we go forth. And now that we talked about precipitation in perspective, let's talk about the extremes. So let me just go ahead and walk you through this instead of just trying to say this is what's happening. The, thing, the map that you're seeing right here is the observed changes in the heaviest precipitation events. So we're talking about events that are greater than one and a quarter inch rains. If you put that into perspective, that's pretty much a lot. And I'm pretty sure many of the other speakers will elaborate about why is that so important. With this, you see that the time period that we were comparing were from 1951 to 1980 and 1981 to 2010 as a comparison of a 30-year um, time period. And to talk about the colors on here, red signifies an increase, blue signifies a decrease. And the larger the circles, or the larger the dot, I should say, the more of a change in, in, change in whether it's increasing or decreasing. But overall, the main takeaway, as many of you have probably can see from this figure is that the trend is showing a very much increasing trend in the heaviest precipitation throughout the region. And we see this prevalently in southern Wisconsin, northern Indiana, southern Michigan, and northern Ohio. So the one takeaway to understand from this is that heavy precipitation events or precipitation events greater than one and a quarter inch rains 
is going to be more frequent or has been seen to be frequent and increasing from the observations and will increase in the future. But now that we've talked about the overall region, let's talk about Ann Arbor's outlooks. So again, as we've seen for the rest of the region, we're going to see more precipitation, more heavy precipitation. But one interesting fact about that precipitation change because of warming temperatures, winter may not always be snow. So if you love the snow this year with every day almost snowing, then you may not be in luck in the future, in which we might see that snow be in the form of um, sleet or freezing rain, or in some cases, rain. And with such rising temperatures, again, this is something that we've seen not only in the observations, but also in the models as well. And with such rising temperatures, we're gonna see a longer um, freeze-free period in the future. So again, these are just things to keep in mind when it comes to not only seeing these trends on the Great Lakes region scale, but also at the local scale of Ann Arbor. And if you, and as shown to the document to the right, this is just a document that we have made for the city of Ann Arbor, in which, again, this summarizes all the climate impacts or climate observations that have been seen in the city since 1951 all the way to 2017. And if you're interested in looking at this document, please feel free to go to this web, go to this link. But otherwise, if you're more interested in what Gleesa does in particular, please feel free to, to go to our website at gleesa.umich.edu. And if you would like to contact me, my email is gatesO at umich.edu. And to contact any of our staff and faculty at Gleesa, please feel free to contact gleesa-info at umich.edu. Thank you for your time. Now it's your turn to see if you're going to be a climatologist one day. So with that, our first question is, how much more precipitation has Ann Arbor received since 1951? A, 24%, B, 33%, C, 44%, or D, 55%? Okay. So if your answer was C, you are mostly correct. The, actually, the actual number for the total precipitation in Arbor is 44.2%, and that's equivalent to 13.4 inches, and that's from the period of 1951 to 2014. So just something to keep in mind. And as stated before, the model projections are varying, but they, are, they have, do have the consensus that precipitation will increase in the future. So for our next question, we have... How much wetter have Ann Arbor's winters become since 1951? All right. If you answer D, you are correct, in which we're saying that winters have been exceeded 75% or 4.4 inches from the time period of 1951 to 2014. And with such warmer temperatures, again, to emphasize, we're going to see varying variants or differences in the precipitation. So it won't always be snow. It might be sleet. And in some cases, it may be rain. Just depends upon how the temperatures act. So for the next question, we have the number of heavy precipitation events in Ann Arbor has increased by what percent since 1951? A, 25, B, 36, C, 41, or D, 55? All right. So. If you answered C, you are mostly correct again. Or you are correct. So from there, <laughs> in Ann Arbor, for the time period or comparison of 1951 through 1980, compared to 1981 to 2010, we've seen an increase of 41.2% in heavy precipitation. So again, these are events where we're seeing greater than a one and a quarter inch rains. But again, the models are saying or, and models are saying more intense events will occur. And this can be in the form of not only one quarter inch rains, but also two inch rains and three inch rains. So it just all is something to consider. So for your final question, to prove that you're a climatologist tonight, how many degrees has Ann Arbor's average temperature increased since 1951? All right, if you answered B, you're correct in which, again, we're seeing from 1951 to 2014, I know it's a common timeline, but just bear with me here. But 
from there, it has increased 0 0.7 degrees Fahrenheit, which is lower than the regional, global, and national averages in warming temperatures. But again, we're seeing that the spring temperatures have increased the most, while the fall has been fairly stable with a slight decrease in recent years. But for Southeast Michigan itself, we're seeing again that that is going to be an increase of three to five, in, uh, three to five degrees Fahrenheit by mid-century. So if you're able to answer all these questions correct, you can just take my job. I can email my program manager later tonight. We can get your contact info, and we'll have everything set. But again, thank you for your time and for the next speaker. Um, my name is Jennifer Lawson. I'm the water quality manager at the city, as I mentioned, in systems planning unit. I get to do all things water. I actually should say everything water on my business card. I facilitate uh, capital planning and asset management for our drinking water, storm water, sanitary sewer systems, collaborating with our public works unit, making sure that we're doing appropriate maintenance, managing our systems appropriately, and I get to do wonderful public outreach with our community about all of those wonderful water systems. Me. So I'm going to show a few maps. Um, Omar gave us a lot of really good data, and that data trend is going to continue. I'm going to talk a lot about data and science, and Brian and, and Earl get to do really great science at the plants, and so you might see a little bit of a trend continuing. This is the city of Ann Arbor. North is up. The freeways are the red ring around. This is probably what most of you are familiar with when you think about the city of Ann Arbor, but this is what I think about all of the water, all of the creeks, where are our rivers in town? And the most important one to point out is the big one that goes from the north west to the southeast. That's the Huron River that flows right through the center of town where a majority of, well, all of our creeks actually in town flow to. We've broken that up into sub sheds or creek sheds. Many of these names are probably familiar to you. Allen Creek, Mallets Creek, Miller's Creek, Fleming Creek, what am I forgetting? Traver Creek, which we have a beautiful golf course up in that area of town. And what on the map is called the Huron River Direct, and that's drainage that when rain falls in that area, it doesn't flow to a creek, it actually flows directly into the Huron River. This is one of my favorite pictures. It was taken about 1920, 1922. And this is what some of the creeks in the downtown area used to look like before all of the elder men in the city of Ann Arbor decided to put them in a pipe. This is Allen Creek. The men on the bridge are actually standing on Washington. I haven't been able to figure out exactly what these addresses are, but I'm sure I could probably go on Google Maps and send someone out there. But keep in mind when you're walking around downtown that there are creeks underground that 100 years ago they were open air and through de the development process we've put them into some very large pipes underground. Speaking of pipes, all of those green lines on the map, those are the stormwater pipes that the city is responsible for. There's a few other colors up there. The blue kind of in the middle, the swath, is actually University of Michigan stormwater pipes. They have their own stormwater pipe and stormwater management system. It does drain into our system, though. There are a few odd colors. There's some, you know, if the dark red is showing up and some of the purple, those are privately owned and county drains. We collaborate with the county on much of our management of the stormwater system. Private drains or privately owned uh, storm pipes are the responsibility of the property owner, and that's a lot of our larger developers um, around the ring of town. This is what those pipes look like. This is what kind of is underground that maybe you have, have never been as fortunate to see. Bless you. So the water goes in the storm inlet on the top, goes through the pipe. This is a wonderful picture of some pipe being installed. So you kind of get to see the, the scale and context of it. And what the pipe looks like when it is spilling out into the Huron River. And this is what happens when the water doesn't stay in the pipe. Oftentimes we have what are called storm surcharges where we get so much rain, as Omar mentioned, we're getting those larger storms, the pipes just cannot handle it. They were not built to handle some of these larger events. Much of our stormwater pipe was put in 50, 60 years ago and there were different design standards at that time. So the water comes out of these inlets as opposed to going into the inlets 
and it comes up and it does flood in the streets. For context, this is depot looking at the, um, the JJR building. It's kind of looking towards the north, northwest. So I've talked a little bit about those pipes under, underground, but I also want to talk a little bit about what the city does to maintain those pipes and some of the cool processes and the cool things that we get to do behind the scenes. So we have robot cameras that inspect all of our pipes. In fact, we have 231 miles of stormwater pipe underground that the city is responsible for. We inspect these pipes seven, 10 years. Again, there's 231 miles of pipe and we only have about six guys citywide that maintain these systems. Another cool number though, so there's 231 miles of pipe there's actually 541 miles of conveyance. That's the pipes plus the ditches and the, and the swales and the creeks. 540 miles uh, can get you pretty far. So our guys take this robot camera and they drive it underground. And I, these are actually some screenshots of the things that they see. This is a stormwater pipe that's pretty nondescript. There's a little bit of grit on the bottom, but this is what we hope to see. But sometimes we see tree roots that's blocking almost 75% of the pipe. Sometimes we see broken pipes. This is relatively common. This pipe is actually made of clay and it's just being crushed under the weight of the, the ground as well as the age of the pipe. We see critters. <laughs> um, usually they run the opposite way, but sometimes you know they, they kind of deer in the headlights, raccoon in the headlights, because our little robot camera has a light on it. Um, and then we see little friends that uh, kind of don't run and they hang out and say hello. Um, so as I mentioned, we have 231 miles of stormwater pipe. That gets you from Ann Arbor to just about Chicago in a kayak if you laid all of our pipes end to end. If you laid all of the pipes and ditches and channels end to end, you can get from Ann Arbor to St. Louis in a kayak. I've never done that. Yes, Absolutely. At the end. At the end. <laughs> Hold that question. So one key point I do want to make, the city of Ann Arbor is very fortunate. We have separate systems for stormwater and wastewater. They do not join, they do not commingle. We have two pipes running side by side in most instances for stormwater and wastewater. Many older communities in the state of Michigan have what are called combined systems where the stormwater actually enters into the sanitary sewer pipe and all of that water gets treated at the wastewater plant. The unfortunate part of what I just said though is that our stormwater does not get treated and much of the stormwater pipes that our stormwater enters, the rainwater enters into, goes out to the Huron River without any treatment whatsoever. So every cigarette butt, every cold cup of coffee, every leaky um, gas tank on a vehicle, all of that stuff does end up in the Huron River untreated. A few things about flooding and design criteria. As I mentioned, our pipes were put in a long time ago. We have several stormwater pipes in the ground that, were, that are 100 years old right now. Not to say that they're bad, because 100 years ago, they built things to last. They truly, I mean, pipes are, were built really thick. So it's not just the age. Um, but what we did, or what I do want to talk about, though, is the design criteria. So now, we design pipes for the storms, the larger storms that we're getting. We, it's called the design criteria for the 10% annual chance of storm that used to be called the 10-year storm, 10-year event. It really is the 10% chance in any given year that that storm may occur. Um, and our stormwater system is also designed to work with the curbs in the streets. And the, the streets do provide some of that storage and conveyance to get the water into the inlets. But we do get really big events. And one of the things we struggle with is managing expectations. So we, we get a lot of phone calls and a lot of concerned residents because we do get storms like this. This is actually a photo from uh, 2015, I believe, over on 
campus. I'm trying to I'm drawing a blank as to exactly where that is. But this storm occurred quickly in the middle of a day, and there were four inches that fell within the matter of just a few hours. Um, our storm system is not designed to handle that. Interesting though, a day later, 24 hours later, not even 24 hours later, the water had drained. The water had gone into the inlets, gone into the pipes, and gone to the Huron River. We cannot manage every drop of water because our system isn't designed to do that. There are areas that are going to have water in them. Um, so I talked a little bit about detention and when we have new development that occurs in town, we do require them to provide stormwater detention on their site. They have to manage the stormwater. In fact, they have to infiltrate the first inch of rain that falls on their property. By infiltrate, I mean that that water has to soak into the ground and they hold it on their site and allow it to go back to Mother Nature as opposed to putting it into a pipe. The, the salmon or the pink colors are the developments with detention. And you can see percentage-wise, so much of this city was built without stormwater detention. A majority of that is that downtown area, the core, even the second ring, which was built in the 60s and 70s. Um, we had a lot of development that happened at that time, but stormwater detention was not part of the design. So as we have new development coming in and redevelopment coming in, we now mandate those developers to put in stormwater detention. So I talked a little bit about data and how we make our decisions. This data is available for the public. This is not secret data. This is not information that we hide. As a matter of fact, all of this data is available online, which is great. I'm actually going to talk about a few screenshots. We work with the USGS for stream gauges. We have five rain gauges around town that give us 15 minute increment data. We have flow meters that we put in our system for project specific so we can actually see how much flow and how deep the flow is and how fast the flow is in our pipes. Um, we have radar rainfall events and so that's not necessarily um, every rainfall but when, when we have large rain events we actually go and calculate where the rain fell because we have found that rainfall may really occur in the south part of town, but the north part of town maybe got a quarter of an inch. And that is really key to the way that we manage stormwater. So I have a few screenshots on the top is a radar rainfall event where we actually can see the darker color, the south part of town got more rain than the northern parts of town. We have impervious data for all of our creek sheds. Um, the one here on the top, Allen Creek, 50% of that creek shed is impervious. Rain gauges, this is avail information available online. We have five of them around town. You can click on the map and see how much rain fell at any given 15 minute increment or any given day. We also have hydrographs as well as flow gauges, I'm sorry, flow gauges um, with the USGS in multiple areas around town. We do utilize a stormwater model, which is a wireframe schematic computer model of our pipe system to start making decisions and building scenarios so when developments occur, we know where stormwater improvements needs to happen. We can also determine where pipes might surcharge, pipes might have issues. This information is utilized for our capital improvement process or our capital planning process so we know what to build. This is actually a printout of that. The red areas are areas where in a 10-year event or a 10% chance event, the pipes will be full. And with that, I'm going to flip it over to Jeopardy. So stormwater. Rain gardens, detention and retention basins, green roofs are all examples of this type of infrastructure. Green infrastructure, plant basins, gray infrastructure or natural absorbance. The answer is green infrastructure. 
We actually have an interactive map online of green infrastructure. If anyone is interested, the city has built almost 100 rain gardens around town, and there are 277 residential rain gardens that we know of. So if you don't tell us you have a rain garden, we won't know about it. Next question. The city has a stormwater rate system that bills properties based on the usage of the stormwater system. Usage is measured by this parameter. Your total roof area, the impervious surface area, how much drinking water you use, or how much property you own. We base it on impervious surface area. So for every drop of rain that falls on hardscape on your property, that's where your fee is related to. Next question, this downtown creek shed contains over 50% impervious surface. Allen Creek, Miller's Creek, Traver Creek, or Mallet's Creek? The answer is Allen Creek. In fact, Allen Creek is 99.9% .9 in a pipe. But we still call it a creek because it still functions like a creek. Next question, how many miles of stormwater conveyance system run through Ann Arbor? 110, 255, 362, or 540 miles? There are 540 miles of conveyance not just the pipes, but the creeks and ditches as well. Another little tidbit that was up there, there are 23,000 stormwater inlets and structures. So every catch basin that you see, there's 22,999 other ones. Um, don't dump anything down them. So again, Brian Steglitz, I'm the manager of water treatment services for the city of Ann Arbor. So in order to differentiate our operators from the operators of the wastewater treatment plant, we, we require all of operators to wear this uniform to work every day. <laughs> so they're a water droplet. Um, that's actually uh, the American Water Works Association mascot. His name is Eddie, and he visits us every year during drinking water week in May. So if you have kids and would like them to have a picture with Eddie, he will be at the water treatment plant on May 5th from 11 to 3. Um, we usually get several hundred people, and we give tours of the water treatment plant. So I'll show you some snippets of the plant today, but if you're interested in walking around and actually seeing the processes, talking to staff, and meeting Eddie, um, feel free to come by from 11 to 3 on May 5th. We're also going to have music. Joe Riley, if you guys are familiar with him, he's a local uh, musician, will be playing. So it should be a fun, fun day. So I think the first video indicated where we get the majority of our drinking water from, and that is the Huron River. Um, we also get some of our drinking water from some wells, which are located on the south side of town uh, on the Ann Arbor Airport property. In addition to water treatment, the other, some of our other responsibilities are managing the four dams along the Huron River that the city of Ann Arbor owns. So Barton is the first dam upstream, followed by Argo, Gettys, and Superior Dam. Two of those dams generate hydropower. So in addition to the drinking water business, we're also in the hydropower business. One thing that I'd like you to walk away from this, this day um, with is historically we've talked about water in these silos, so storm water, wastewater, drinking water. And as part of some future public education campaigns, the Ann Arbor is going to be trying to um, talk about this concept of one water. And I think what you'll see is, is that really all of these things are connected. So you know, we happen to use a drink, the Huron River as a drinking water source, but there's some folks upstream of us who are wastewater plants who are discharging their um, wastewater into the Huron River, and storm water is coming into the Huron River, and we're using that as a source of drinking water. So protecting the source is really critical to us. As much as we can do to keep things out of our water bodies, the less we're going to have to do to treat. Um, and with the ability to detect things at so levels, you're, you're probably following in the media, some of Earl's biggest challenges are things that are coming from the water treatment plant, things that we may not be able to remove that he's actually going to be responsible for dealing with after it flows through all the pipes and reaches the plant. So having all of these water systems work together is really critical for our success in the future. So this, do I have a, yes, I do have a laser pointer. This is a, an aerial view of the water treatment plant. So we're located on Sunset Road. 
Uh, this, we're, we're bounded by 14 up here, and then this is Pomona. Here's a whole bunch of houses, and then there's a whole bunch of houses over there. So we're pretty much landlocked. We don't have a whole lot of property. That would be the first takeaway from this picture. Um, this part over here, which looks like a lot of green area, the space that maybe if we needed to use it in the future we could, is actually a six million gallon reservoir. So that's finished water stored underground, and we can't really build anything on top of it. So we're, we're pretty much limited in terms of space. Um, so in the future, that, you know, that may be an issue as we're trying to deal with future treatment challenges. Uh, when this plant was built in 1938, all of the, there was no housing around here at all. Most of this was built in the 1950s. A lot of Ann Arbor was built po in post-war building booms. So this was all apple orchards and the plant was sort of sitting there. So shame on us for not buying up all that property and having it available to us now, but I guess you live and learn. So this is who we are. We have 30 employees. Um, we're 24 seven because for some reason you customers want water at every hour of the day. We can't just shut you down at night. Uh, so 24 seven, there's at least two people at the water treatment plant up there. So there's a rotating shift. Our, our supervisors actually work a really interesting shift. We have five of them and there's always one of them at the plant. They work 12 hours on, 12 hours off for seven days straight and then they're off for seven days. So interesting working schedule. They work a week, then they're off a week, work a week. Um, but when they're working, they're, they're busy and it's a long week to put in 80 hours in seven days. Our operators and staff are all licensed, which is really important to you because you want to make sure that the people who are responsible for driving, delivering the water that you consume every day have a license and are certified and know exactly what they're doing. Um, that's not the condition in all states, but in Michigan they require, particularly for plants of our size, operators to be licensed. So we think that that's a good thing and we need to make sure that we continue to provide our operators opportunities for the continuing education and things that they need to maintain their licenses. So you've seen some pictures in some of Jen's slides about Ann Arbor. Um, we, we ba our service area is basically inside those, um, the highways 23, 94, and 14. Um, we serve 125,000 people. Um, we also serve parts of SIO and Ann Arbor Township, so they're um, sale for resale customers. So they, we sell the water to them and they sell it back to their individual customers who are on city water. About 28,000 accounts and obviously the university is one of our largest customers, um, particularly the University of Michigan Hospital and obviously a critical customer. Pfizer used to be a big customer, um, one of our largest industrial customers until they left. Now that's the North Campus Research Center. Um, still use a reasonable amount of water, but not nearly as much as Pfizer did. So some of our average demands have gone down with the migration of some customers like that over the past uh, five to seven years. So in this picture, a couple things that I would like to point out. So we, when the plant was built, it's usually when you're building a water system, you want the water treatment plant built high elevation upstream, wastewater treatment plant, low elevation downstream. Um, obviously you want your water treatment plant upstream of your wastewater treatment plant. I think that's relatively intuitive. But from an elevation standpoint, pumping is one of the most expensive things that we can do. So if we can have the plant at a high elevation and we can use gravity to feed the majority of the city and then have all, also the wastewater flow by gravity to where the wastewater plant is at a low elevation downstream, we're taking advantage of those natural forces and making our operations as efficient as possible. So that's why the water treatment plant is located where it is. It's the second highest elevation in the city. When the city, when that plant was built, Ann Arbor really hadn't sprawled that much, so the majority of the city was be able to be fed just by gravity. And if you look in this picture, that middle district that's green, we call gravity district. So all of that is just water flowing out of that reservoir at the plant, downhill to those people who live in that service district and businesses, no pumping. As Ann Arbor grew and, and over the years and expanded into some high elevations because there's a pretty significant amount of topography around Ann Arbor, um, we've had pump and that's what we call these service areas around their high service areas. So we have pump stations that we're pumping from the plant to feed those areas and we have remote pump stations located around the city. Um, we also have elevated tanks and the purpose of elevated tanks, I think you probably recognize some of them, um, this one up here in the right corner won the uh, tank of the year based on the artwork that was done on it in 2017 and that's down Washington on near um, uh, Whole Foods if you're familiar with that part of town and the other water tower is up on north campus of um, the University of Michigan. Um, so the purpose of those is having this reservoir of water high elevation in the sky to provide pressure for the surrounding areas. 
So it, it, there's not really a huge amount of water that's stored in those elevated tanks. It's primarily for pressure regulation. Um, in this other picture in the upper left, the map, you'll see lots of little water tower looking things, I guess. Um, there's 13 of them. Those are our sampling locations. So we're, we're required to collect 100 samples a month from sites around the city in order to make sure that the water that we deliver to you is safe to drink. So we're, co we're doing uh, chlorine analysis to make sure that there's disinfectant residual at your taps. Um, we're also doing bacteriological analyses to make sure that there's nothing harmful in the water that could potentially make our customers sick. So 100 samples of that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about our sampling in the next couple slides. When this plant, the plant was built, there was one primary reason for the water treatment plant from the treatment perspective, and that was to remove hardness. Ann Arbor's water is quite hard. The water from the river is hard. The water from the wells is hard. If we don't remove the hardness in the water, this is what the pipes and plumbing in your house is going to look like. That's scale. Um, it's primarily calcium carbonate. It precipitates more at high temperatures than low. So the inside of your hot water heaters are going to be scaled with that, and then they're not going to be functioning any longer. Even our finished water now, even though we remove a lot of the hardness, um, has, it's still quite hard, and we still, in Ann Arbor, your, your life expectancy of your hot water heater is probably like six to eight years because of the hardness level in the water. So we use lime in order to um, remove that hardness. We raise the pH of the water, and we're precipitating those things out at the plant, the calcium and magnesium. So we, when we use lime, it's actually a pebble. It's a, a rock, it's mined, it's not lime like this, so we're not making margaritas, we're actually making drinking water at the plant. Um, when we talk about um, treatment of drinking water, the, the key is to have multiple barriers to prevent, before the water leaves the plant, to catch anything that could potentially um, make our customers sick. So we have a, a softening process, we have a disinfection process, and we have a filtration process, and then we disinfect again. Lots of barriers to make sure that the water that we deliver is safe. So we use ozone as our primary disinfectant. Um, we added that about 20 years ago, be primarily because of regula regulatory purposes, um, that we were having a hard time meeting the disinfection requirements and the disinfection byproduct requirements at the same time. If we add more disinfection, you have this risk of having byproducts of disinfection, which also are not good. So ozone was the right solution for us in order to help us meet those requirements. And it also is a really good for water tasting. Um, and hence, since then, we've won the state water um, taste off contest three times since our ozone was put in. We do 145,000 tests a year on the drinking water to make sure it's safe for our customers. So that's a lot of tests. Um, the lab at the plant also does the analytical work for Earl's folks at the wastewater plant. So we collect samples from there. Um, site and we bring them to the plant and we do the analyses on those. So there's lots of analytical work done on the water every year. That pretty much wraps up, I think, um, what I wanted to talk about. And I guess we're going, moving on to Jeopardy 2. Uh, it just went by itself. And, <laughs> um, so just remember the, th the, the one water concept. I think that was my last point on that last side and that all of these systems are connected. Okay, let's dive into Jeopardy here. The city of Ann Arbor supplies water to approximately how many people? Okay, I know the answer to this one. Um, 100,000 A, 125,000 B, 150,000, or 160,000? Do I advance the slides for this? No, I do. You do, okay. Don't touch it. Okay, yep, I was right, 125,000. <laughs> The Ann Arbor water supply is comprised of both surface and groundwater sources. What percent comes from surface water? 15% A, 35% B, 60% C, or 85% D? Okay, I'm two for two on the water questions. That's $1,000, Matt, that I'm getting from you. Uh, the Ann Arbor Water Treatment Plant uses it's this chemical molecule to disinfect the water before distribution. Chlorine, ozone, trizone, sodium benzoate. The ozone. And the last question, when was the water treatment plant commissioned? In 1912, 1920? 
1938. All right, I think, Earl, I think you're up. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, I get to pull up the rear on this uh, presentation. I think that's only fitting since it's wastewater. Matt, there's my obligatory bad joke. I, I knew you wanted to hear one, so. Uh, again, my name is Earl Kenzie. I'm the wastewater treatment plant manager. Um, this is an aerial view of the plant, and it's actually fairly recent. Um, there's a few things you can note about it. One is, is that there's a railroad right to the north of the plant all along here. And the Huron River flows from northwest back over to the uh, southeast and then northeast again. And then the eastern boundary of the plant is bound by Fleming Creek. So as you can see, we're landlocked and fully developed very similarly to uh, how the water plant is. Our plant, too, was also first constructed in the mid-1930s, and we went through quite a lot of iterations. The most recent, though, was over the last nine years. Um, we've actually done $150 million worth of construction. And we're very much up to speed on where we need to be, although there's other places that we still have to be uh, conscientious about in terms of capital planning. Um, one of the things I'd point out too is that as part of this project that we just recently did, we also incorporated some best management practice features for stormwater as well. Uh, we've put in some uh, uh, pervious pavements. We have some rain gardens. We also have some uh, zero detention, uh, zero discharge detention ponds as well. And I, I think that kind of speaks to what Brian was talking about. We really can't look at uh, wastewater treatment separately from water treatment, separately from stormwater. We really have to take a holistic look at water in general because we're all part of the whole same uh, piece of the puzzle, so to speak. So uh, the wastewater treatment plant services not only the city of Ann Arbor, but also portions of three surrounding townships, uh, namely Ann Arbor, Pittsfield, and Sio. Uh, we service on the order of 130,000 plus uh, people, depends on the time of year, of course, with school uh, being in, in, in uh, session or not. We also are uh, staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year by certified technicians. Um, and that's because the flow never stops. It always comes in. So no matter what we do, we have to make sure that we're able to take the flow in, treat it properly, and deal with the solids that we remove from the plant. So if there are ever any issues with regards to equipment or anything else, it's not as though we can do a shutdown and, and take a week to fix everything and then go back and service. So um, that's a, a very critical aspect of the, what we do. We're also uh, regulated by both federal and state agencies. Uh, Brian was mentioning how much uh, sampling and testing goes on. We actually do daily monitoring of our discharge and we report that out to the state every month. So I, we have to permit limits that we have to meet. Uh, and typically we do an excellent job of doing so. Um, our permitted capacity, really it's the design capacity of the plant, is 29.5 million gallons per day. And that's on an annual average basis. That's not to say that we can't handle more than 29.5 million gallons per day if, if it came in. What that says is on an annual average basis at that flow, we would be able to give full treatment to everything and readily meet our permit limits. Right now we're averaging somewhere in between um, 17 or 18 million gallons per day. One of the things I would point out though is um, Jen mentioned earlier, and she said it was from 2015, so now I know it's June 27, 2015, because it happens to be my birthday. But um, we saw our plant flow triple in a half hour. And that's almost unheard of. We went from right around 17 million gallons per day to within a half hour being over 50 million gallons per day. Yeah, and that, that's the most extreme uh, increase over the shortest period of time that we've ever seen in the 25 years I've been at the plant. Um, and the thing about that is, is that if you know and you see the flow is trending up, you can readily plan for it, you can adjust, you can do what you need to do. In this case, we had a supervisor that really had to scramble and did an excellent job of doing so. Um, but that's part of the thing that we always look at is knowing that we're 24 seven, we have to be ready for any change that comes along for any reason. So as we see this climate change, as we see more intense rainfall, um, we have to be ready for it. The other thing I'd point out about that storm, it was hardly raining at the plant itself. The plant's located in Ann Arbor Township, right near uh, 23 and Gettys, Dixborough Road area, right near St. Joe's Hospital. We were hardly getting any rain that day, and here it was, it was 
flooding in other parts of town, it definitely impacted us. As you look at wastewater treatment, most of the water, or most of what comes into the plant is water. Uh, very little portions of it are solids, both um, settable solids or solids that are suspended or dissolved solids. Our job is to get the solids out of the water as best we can. So that's really the challenge that's put forth to us. So I kind of look at wastewater treatment from two separate streams, one being the liquid side, and we have what we call primary treatment, secondary tre treatment, which is typical of most wastewater treatment plants in the United States. But we also have tertiary treatment um, as well as disinfection. On the solid side, there are things that we remove. The majority of what we remove are biosolids. And that's removed both in the primary and secondary treatment phases of our process. Some of the other things you see there, though, screenings, grit, and then also fats, oils, and greases, which are really the things that float to the top of water, the fog, as we call it. Um, those are things that end up in the landfill. So quite often we try to encourage people not to put certain things down the drain or down the toilet or, or in sewers, obviously, because they could be putting it into to stormwater sewers as well. But the vast majority of what we remove are biosolids, and then we do different things with those that I'll explain a little more in, in, uh, in the future slide here. Half of our flow that comes into the plant comes from the north side of town, and it has to be lifted by these large screw pumps, one of which you can see here. Um, the rest that comes from the south side actually flows by gravity. Once the flow is lifted from the north side up into the plant, everything flows by gravity through the plant. And this is some of the grit removal up front that we, we remove um, fast settling material as well as screenings where we try to get large materials out. Uh, I don't want to go into a whole lot of detail about all the processes, but these are some of the things that you'd see either from an aerial photograph or by coming through and taking a tour of the plant. Um, this is an open settling tank. Biosolids settle to the bottom of this tank and then fog or fats, oils, and grease rise to the top and we remove both of those for further processing. The area on the left side here is a big part of our secondary treatment. It's a biological treatment. And what happens there is we um, supply air mixing and the uh, wastewater actually supplies a carbon source or a food, if you will, for microorganisms to uh, consume and reproduce. And in doing so, they uptake phosphorus because they're making ATP to make new cells. So what, what you're getting there is you're getting nutrient removal, you're also getting the dissolved solids out of the wastewater, and at the same time we're taking ammonia and converting it to nitrogen. If we didn't do that, if, if, if our wastewater went into the river, it would suck all the oxygen out of the river and, and leave something that without fish. So um, you would really destroy it. And that really terrible picture over here is just a, a picture of our tertiary treatment, which is sand filters. And that's just one that's being backwashed with air and water, which we have to do daily. We went to ultraviolet light for disinfection back in December of 2000. Previous to that, we were using chlorine and then using sulfur dioxide to dechlorinate. But we took a look at the uh, impacts on the environment of chlorine byproducts as well as the potential risk to staff, to uh, the environment, and to the local community if we ever had an accident with one of those one-ton chlorine cylinders that we had. And we made a decision to move over to ultraviolet disinfection. So we literally use bulbs and they uh, kill off pathogens before we discharge to the Huron River. Biosolids are something we deal with daily. Um, they're very rich in organic material. They're also rich in phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, and these are some of the th types of equipment that we use. This is actually a, a, a belt thickener that just allows liquid um, biosolids to thicken a little bit as it travels over time. In the, in the winter, we actually use centrifuges to dewater the biosolids so that we can dispose of them in the landfill. That's really our only option during the non-growing uh, season. And then during the uh, non-winter months, we land apply liquid biosolids. And what you see here is a tanker truck that actually loads up at the plant, goes out to a farmer's field and loads up this terrigator which uh, then injects the liquid biosolids into the ground as a, as a fertilizer. That's a beneficial reuse of the biosolids, which is something we really try to maximize as best we can. Um, one of the things that is very critical, though, is that 
that program is managed and properly uh, monitored so that we don't exceed any of the uh, application rates based on whatever the biosolids have in terms of um, whether it's certain metals or other things. But it's also not to put more phosphorus or nitrogen into the ground than what's really needed. So from our perspective, there's a few things that we always try to encourage, and that's really for uh, people to consider what not to put down the toilet. And, and by law, we can say people are not able to discharge anything that is going to cause pass-through. And we say or interfere with plant operation, actually it could also interfere with uh, the collection system. Um, some of the things that should not be flushed down, or you can see up there any plastic or latex products, we often see that come up. Um, hair, again, fats, oils, or grease. It's not a good idea to pour grease down the drain. You're better off letting it congeal and throwing it out. When it comes to us, we eventually have to get it out of the water and have it go to the landfill anyway. So it just takes more effort and money to do so. So it really is, is not disappearing when it goes down the drain. Obviously, no trash um, and, and no pharmaceuticals. This is one area where there's a lot of research going on right now. When we talk about harmful or hazardous chemicals, um, anything that could be um, you know, harmful to the collection system or to the public in general, uh, things like the, anything explosive or combustible or flammable or anything along those lines, that's really the type of thing that you really don't want to send down. Uh, one of the things I don't see up here, but I know was mentioned recently, flushable wipes are not flushable. They should not go down the drain. Uh, paper towels should not go down the drain. Um, toilet paper is fine, but beyond that, you really don't want to put anything else down the drain. Uh, otherwise, it's just going to take more time, effort, and money to uh, remove it and send it to the landfill. So with that... Question is, only three materials can be safely flushed down your toilet. Human waste, wastewater, and A, flushable wipes, B, deceased aquatic pets, C, paper towel, D, toilet paper. And we all knew that one. D is toilet paper, the answer. Flushing other items can clog the sewer lines, but not only the city sewer lines, but your own. And, and those are the ones that you're responsible for, and you have to pay the plumber to come and fix. So, uh, Next question. Pouring these substances, sometimes referred together as fog, down the drain can cause hardened buildup to clog drains. A, fish oils and grease. B, fats, organics, and greens. C, fats, oils, and grease. Or D, fish, organics, and greens. And the answer is fats, oils, and grease. And yeah, I kind of led you on that when I said it about <laughs> 10 times during the presentation. <laughs> uh, the current wastewater treatment plant has a permitted design capacity of how many million gallons per day? A, 15.5 million, B, 18 million, C, 25 million, or D, 29.5 million. And again, that's... It's, it says it's a permitted capacity, and in a way it is. It's the basis upon which our, um, our limits and our permit are, are, are based. But it doesn't mean that we're violating our permit if we discharge more than that. In fact, during the past week when we had that rain um, this past weekend, we saw our flows go up from around uh, 21 up to 34. This is for the whole day, up to about 34 million gallons per day, and it's been trending back. Uh, today we were right around 23. So even though we do have a separate uh, sewer system, stormwater and uh, sanitary, we get a lot of infiltration and inflow. So we do see when we have large wet weather events, we do see an increase in our flow. And then the last question, how many miles of sanitary sewer collection pipe run to the wastewater treatment plant? Gee, I hope that came up in a different presentation because I don't think I had that in mind. Uh, a, 362, B, 409, C, 534, and D, 734. The answer is A, 362. I'm going to find out who put this question <laughs> in there because one of the things I want to know is, does that include from the townships? No. 
Okay. That's the see that see. <laughs> I can get the number for the townships. <laughs> no, it's the miles that the city was responsible for maintenance. Very good. Well, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, hopefully there's a little bit of daylight outside so you can still enjoy that beautiful weather that we are so fortunate to have. And uh, if you have questions regarding the um, climate action project that was just awarded by the city, please make sure you see Joe Oren in the back of the room. Those of you who were awarded prizes, please make sure you see Emily in the back of the room and have a wonderful evening and travel safe. This program was recorded on April 19th, 2018 at the Ann Arbor District Library.